done an event that is tied in with the center, but that's I guess that's not a, too unusual since the center itself is so new. It's it's really not quite open yet. We had our what we call the soft opening and Buford uh, this past weekend when we had the Pat Conroy Literary Festival, the first one ever. We were not affiliated with that. Um, that uh, was USCB. University of South Carolina Newport and University of South Carolina France, and they had already planned it. They decided uh, last year, you know, so success, the uh, Pat Conroy 70 uh, birthday celebration they had was so successful and had people from all over the country come that they would, uh, be, you know, do this again. So have, have it, and that was that was uh, the first first one. I think I said that, but anyway. I hope that some of y'all will attend next year. We might even be able to get Mr. Brad to come. I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we need right now, please. I, I had no idea that starting a nonprofit was such a pain, you know, what to wear. Uh, it took us like three months to get our nonprofit status. But we are fully nonprofit and we can. Did you just pour this water for me? I did. I poured you more, but it sounded thing. like the Niagara Falls. When I did. <laughs> <laughs> when I oh, that's so sweet. I'm just that kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> and he is. He really is. So, what do we what do we need to start with tonight? We're supposed to be reminiscing about Pat. Well, I, I I heard you tell a story about Pat's. Uh, Interaction with the, with the Bellman oh and uh, and while I make the Niagara Falls noise again, <laughs> I want you to tell these folks that, and I'll tell story. them my version of it, which is closer to the truth. <laughs> no, mine's unfortunately absolutely true. Okay, we Rick and I spoke together on stage at the Cato Festival of Labor Day uh, weekend, and they had given us a very difficult task. There were five of us up there. So they asked us to to share just one memory of, of Pat. One of our favorite memories of Pat is the festival was dedicated to an issue. And um and one of uh, one of our favorite uh, I was about to say verses. One of our favorite verses. Damn long way from verses. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, lines or passages or something books. So I had I had so much trouble coming up with something because I have so many and, and I knew I wanted to share something so sort of humorous. And I was thinking that about the only time I've ever seen Pat totally speechless. Because if you ever met him saw him speak at something. He was the sharpest person on his feet I have ever seen. I mean, he always had a quick answer. And I'm, I'm the kind of person that after, oh shoot, why didn't I think to say so? And, you know, I never think of a, a great comeback at the time. But boy, Pat was just firing right back to me. So I decided not to tell him about the, the one time I was going to give a couple of examples first <clears throat> of, of times when he, when he, you know, came back like he did. Um, he, he loved, to, you know, he was at a, a running war with the, the Citadel, his alma mater, <laughs> for so many years. And he loved to pick <coughs> them, and I think he, they loved to pick him. And, and, you know, he was banned from campus for a long time. He was banned and all this kind of stuff. So it was not unusual to have Citadel guys, because the Pat was there, they were all guys, usually say something snide to him, you know. And uh, I, I would I would cringe when when this happened because, you know, first until I learned, boy, he take care of himself. I don't <laughs> I don't need to do any cringing on his behalf, you know. Feel feel bad for the person that that asked him. <laughs> <laughs> Dead, and he uh, uh, had a, a, a Citadel guy 
Oh, he did say, uh, one time he said that Citadel owed him a debt of gratitude that they, he, was, he was living proof that uh, they could produce a, a graduate who knew how to use a semicolon and knew that it was not part of the small intent. <laughs> And so that's why, you know, they were always going hand in with each other like this. And so sure enough, at an event like this one time, a uh, guy stood up and he said, Mr. Conroy, my Citadel friends tell me not to take the Lord's discipline seriously, that you are not a typical Citadel friend. And Pat said, you're right, pal. I'm a whole lot nicer. I'm a whole lot richer, and I'm a whole lot smarter. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not typical. <laughs> so, but the time Rick was, was talking about, uh, we, uh, he was speaking that thing in Atlanta, and I got him, they put us up at, this, up at, at the Ritz Carlton downtown, and uh, this very dignified black gentleman uh, took, the, uh, took our suitcases up to her. For us. And he said, uh, at this, you know, we get into the room and so forth. He said, uh, uh, I heard them say downstairs that you and your both said to Pat, you know, you and your wife are both writers. And Pat said, That's right, we are, but she writes pornography and I write Christian fiction. <laughs> Praise the Lord, brother. I run a Christian radio program, and the Lord told me he was going to send a speaker for tomorrow morning. I don't know how Pat got out of that one, because I was laughing so hard. Last time I looked, he was just kind of saying, <laughs> so Rick had a similar story. Well, uh... The thing you realize very early on is that, you know, the truth mattered very little to him. <laughs> Never let that stand away from you. No, 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 no. In case y'all are wondering why I'm here, uh, you, 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 might, you might think that, you know, it's just because he was kind of my champion and my friend. Like a lot, he is a lot right. Um, but mostly because of, and I hate to break this, to I really hate to break it to a room full of really nice folks, but, you know, I'm his illegitimate son. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he, his affection with, with people like me had a, a, it couldn't just be affection. It had to be affection, uh, that had stickers on it, had, you know, bars on it, you know, and, and he would, literally, the first message I ever got from him was uh, on one of those old-fashioned pink receptionist, uh, you know, things, and, and it said, uh, for sorry-ass Rick Bragg, <laughs> comma, and then underneath that comma, I still had it, it's back on my message board, but he, uh, he just started telling, once he, he read my stuff and he wrote me the best book jacket blurb endorsement has ever been. And, 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 and he would say things to you that you know he meant. Like he would end every phone call with, uh, I love you son. And, and, uh, but then when he would go out to events like this, when I was like 300, or a thousand miles away and could not defend myself. <laughs> he would be in, he, and he was so insidious about it. It wasn't that he did it, you know, but he was insidious. He would plant the seed or the germ and let it slowly spread out in the population. And, you know, he wouldn't say it in front of a gathering this size. He would wait until he was signing books. And and sweet ladies 
would walk up to him and say, and I can't do a sweet lady southern accent voice, but poor old Mr. Conroy, you know, I love you, but I, I mostly love you because you're so kind to that Rick Bragg. You're just so kind. And he would lower his head and shake it and say, Yes, ma'am, I know, and it's such a tragedy. <laughs> Did you know that he is now writing pornography? <laughs> and, and they would say, Oh, tee hee, tee hee, that's not true, is it? And he would say, well, Yes, ma'am, it's not something I'm proud of, but it is true. <laughs> So they would come to me at my next book event and tell me what a great disappointment I was. To <laughs> and then I would say, but ma'am, it, ma'am, it's not true. I, I've never written, my mama wouldn't even let me put the F word in a book. I mean, she, she blacked it out with a Sharpie. And, uh, and uh, so they would go back to Pat at his next event and say, oh, Mr. Conroy, I'm so, you really had us going. And he would lower his head again. And he'd say, did he tell you I made it up? He's been telling everybody <laughs> to save his career. <laughs> so I, it's a, all kidding aside, it's a, you know, it's a pleasure to sit with this lady and talk about him, although you know, I, I, I've never had a friend that would call me up and harangue me for not calling him. When I call him once a month for my life, for a quarter century, called him once a month, and most of the time got this mailbox is full. <laughs> it is no longer taking calls. And then he would call me back to harangue me for not calling him with these words. And, and I know that other people have heard it, but Bragg, this is the message he'd leave on my machine. Bragg, this is Conroy. Obviously, it's up to me to keep this dying friendship alive. <laughs> Ours could have been a father-son relationship, but you spurned me for the big shop New York people. <laughs> Ours could have been a loving, familial relationship. But you tossed me aside like an old tissue in the gutter. And I still love you, son. Hang up. What I want to know is, why in the hell didn't y'all get a better answering machine? Yeah, he did the same. He did the same with me. It's so it's so aggravated with him. Um, he, he did not answer the phone at all. The ringer was turned off altogether. <laughs> and he would forget to check his messages for days at that, at that time. Uh, finally, he'd, I would have people, you know, like his publicist or somebody about an event that he had to know about or something he had, you know, that really needed to be done. And I would say, Pat, they said they've left you so many messages. You've got to do, you know, you've got to check it. And he would do it, but but uh, but you know he still he would still not you know answer anything, and I would be traveling or something, and I could always tell when Pat was going to to call, uh, check you know check in while I was traveling and so forth. It would be the exact moment that I either had to stop in you know, the ladies' room or you know to put gas in the car or something. I would have missed, missed his call. Well, I couldn't call him back, or if I tried to, blame answer machine. It was full, and then when he finally, like that evening, late that evening, he was 
said, well, I've been trying to get in touch with you. <laughs> oh, well, I've been worried about something like that, so it was, it was. <laughs> he was full of it as Christmas turkey. Ah, yes. <laughs> it was. The, the first time we met was, um, I'm in at, Atlanta at the airport, and, uh, and I call my mama, and my mama says to me, Pat Conroy's on his way over here. <laughs> I think he said he was bringing his fiance or something like that, and 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 I, uh, well, he hadn't given me any warning. That, and apparently, he didn't want to see me. He just wanted to see my mama. And I and Pat had an unusual uh, relationship with my mom. He he knew her mostly through the book, and if you can read that book, not love my mama, then there's something wrong. But but he just decided. He's going to come visit. So he, and you got to understand, I, I didn't really want Pat Conroy in my house with, because the first thing my mama did when she found out Pat Conroy was caught was come was to call everybody. <laughs> everybody. And, uh, and I lived two hours, well, back then, two hours from my mama's front door to the Delta County. And I did it in an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> and I come literally smoking. Uh, I mean, just wore the brakes down to nothing. And, you know, it's hard to get through Heflin, Alabama and not get a speeding ticket. <laughs> Other place. And, uh, and I got, came running in the house, and there is. A, my entire extended family. Uh, Pat Conroy, his fiance, and and first of all, why he felt the need to come to Alabama to get him a good woman. <laughs> you know, you know we, it ain't like we got you know enough to even go around for us. <laughs> but, but, and, 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 and half a German chocolate cake. He brought my mom a half, and I still don't know what happened to the other half of the German chocolate cake. Five guesses. And, and I remember thinking as I looked at half the German chocolate cake, and then I said, may I get you something to drink? And he, and he said, well, I can't drink that sweet tea. You know, I got the sugar. <laughs> But did he have, he was the kind of liar, and, and, and not on the important things, but the, he was the kind of liar that you could not tell. I mean, you really couldn't tell. I mean, he was a master at it. it how did you not kill him yourself? Well, there were times. <laughs> One thing he, he used to do, well, so many things like that he would do. And I'm, I'm going to get back to that cake in a minute, but it's like Rick would say he would... Uh, it's a good thing my I have three sons love Pat to death. You know they just adore, and uh, and he he did I mean love picking at him and so forth because he was like big teeth. That's all I mean. He was you know just had that interaction, but he would make these you know talks and stuff. And he would say something about so uh, you know Cassandra and her three sorry sons. <laughs> Here, here are these sorry boys show up at my doors, this kind of stuff. And I didn't think much. It's kind of like Rick. I didn't think much about it. First I thought time. you really had sorry boys. No, he told me that. That's, that's, here's the thing. I would, then these little old ladies would say, well, so honey, all of us have our problems. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know my, my daughter had trouble with one of her sons. Too. <laughs> stuff, stuff like this. And, you know, there's really no defense. I don't want to say he's the biggest liar <laughs> in the world, but uh, uh, he, but he could he could just be so convincing. He would even convince me when I knew something wasn't true. <laughs> he, he, he had me believing that I really was a bad friend. Yeah, he, he had me, you know, and I would get frust very frustrated about it because, you know, because he would, uh, 
I, I found out later that that, that call that he left for me, he left a hundred other people, and and he would um, he would, but, but every writer, uh, and, and I'm, I was a little different because I started in you know in print. We used to say newspapers. Remember them? That's some kind of oblong thing. You know? <laughs> Got that too, except on Sunday. And uh, but, but but yeah, there's a place in your book life where it can go either way. I mean, you can either you can either be on the best times bestseller list, or you can you can um, or you, or you can uh, write elegant books that never push through that membrane. You know, to, to for New York publishers to write me checks. That, you know, buy donkeys and shit with. But, uh, but uh, no, that's the only thing my mom ever asked for. I bought her two houses. The only thing she ever wanted was two miniature donkeys. That's <laughs> but, uh, but, but anyway, I never will forget. Uh, unsolicited, my publisher did not send him, didn't ask him for an endorsement. Uh, he just got the book. It was showers all over the shower. This, this is a go on, yes, ma'am. Uh, and uh, uh, almost said roll tide. <laughs> and I learned you don't do that in Birmingham because half the people get up and leave. So, but, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, he was so without trying. He'd make you feel like you could walk through that wall. And what he did with me was he he, he sent me a note. That endorsement was not something he emailed to my publisher. It was a note he wrote me. Um, and um, you know, and I didn't know the way the game was played. And, and I, you know, I just told my the publisher in New York, and I had you know, the best publisher in the country. And, and uh, and I said, guess who called me? Pat Conway called me and, or sent me this note and liked this. And, and they like killed themselves getting it down, you know, and putting it on the back of the book. But he told me something. He, he, he said, he said, yeah, they called me about that. I don't mind doing that. But he looked me right in the eye and he said, but you don't need no help. You don't need no help. And he said it just like that. He was such an elegant as y'all all know, he was such an elegant speaker that when he dropped into that little bit of little tiny little speck of white trash that he had, <laughs> you know, when he would drop into that, it, it was always a little startling. But but when he said that, it, you know, I, I, I thought, well, and, and pardon my French, but I thought, hell, I can do this. <laughs> you know, I, I can do this, and and uh, and I, so. As much as I hate to say anything nice about him, even now, uh, changed my life. And I, I just wonder how many people he did. I, I, I can only imagine. Uh, it certainly, certainly changed mine as well. But he, he was, um, he was the funniest person I've ever known. Probably making, making that clear. But uh, he was, he was the most generous and especially to, to other writers. And Rick and I could tell you some tales that you probably wouldn't even want to know about that is not common among writers, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it, it's, it shouldn't be a competitive sport, but sometimes it's played as, as though it were. And I've heard people say, well, I just don't know how verbal it got to be, so mine a lot better than that, this kind of stuff. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of a, you just don't think of other writers being that generous to to each other, and and but it wasn't just it was it was a gen a great generosity of spirit where uh, Pat uh, spent so much time you know encouraging himself, but he he exactly what Rick said he would make you think you could do this you know you you can do it. And, and he would not put up with any, you know, uh, 
mealy mouthing, you know, oh, well, I don't know if I could, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'd wine stuff like that. He wouldn't listen to that. <clears throat> if you were going to start whining, you know, something like that. You, you didn't want to be around him. He would, <laughs> yeah, he would, he would um, tell you you were right. You didn't have any business doing it. That was going to be your attitude. You know, and, that's, and there's something to be said for that. You defeated yourself before you even start, unless you believe, unless you believe in yourself. But he, he always, he, he would get so excited about other writers. I'll never yeah. forget when he, when he got all of the books out. And I don't know who said, I, you know, I don't know. I if still a, don't know. A publisher, I know. If, I mean, maybe, you know, one of the other publishers says, oh, he's got, he's, he, this is, Right up his alley, he'd love this, you know, something like that. But I know he he got he got the book. I know he told me about it because I had when I well, first met Pat uh, with Mont Bauer, but then I was I had, um, was teaching over gas and study, and he and he you know said this is somebody over in your neck of the woods, and um, got this unbelievable book. He got it written. And then it's the reason <clears throat> we went over to uh, to see Rick's mom. This was Pat's idea. Just sort of, he had come over to to uh, visit me and guess and, and said, you know, let's go over. Let's, let's go. Over. And he had um, he had sent your mother flowers, so he knew you know the address and must have had a phone number. If he called and told her, he, he was you know he was on his way over. But um, uh, as a, a sweet, you know, Southern belle, I couldn't go to anybody's house without, without uh, something. But it was kind of spur of the spur of the moment, and I had a, a German chocolate cake that I had to bake from scratch. <laughs> you know, with the, the German chocolate bar and stuff. I mean, I didn't take mix and bomb or anything. And but my it, mama said it was an excellent. It cake. was a <laughs> But we had already been nibbling on. <laughs> Even though he had the sugar, he, he, didn't, he didn't give me a chance, you know, to cook something else. So I thought, well, maybe they won't notice it's just that. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're slow over there. <laughs> yeah. We, we would look at it and say, this looks like half a cake, but it must be a whole one if it's smart people in Edward County. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, we're just hoping we can live up to them smarts over our head a while now. <laughs> so we, we had a, uh, uh, we had a, a, a we, some writers can be a little catty. And, no. and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, Stephen King took some pretty good shots at me in the New York Times book review. He did. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't like my Jerry Lee Lewis book at all. And he uh one that made the best star list. Yes. One of the premier music right more. We're not gonna mention it. <laughs> but he, he didn't like it at all and and, uh, and, uh, and I could just hear Pat, you know. I could just hear Pat in my ear. What would Pat have said? And and it, and I knew Pat would have said Well first he would have said, You want me to call him up? <laughs> because when I had been when I had been uh, bad mouthed in a, in a, uh, by another Southern writer, Pat had literally called me up and said, "You want me to ruin him?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and look, I'm sorry, but you know this accent is not put on. <laughs> Some of us are not improvable like <laughs> others are. Some of us are just going to be the way we are and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, we're haters. <laughs> we remember, and I could see a tiny, tiny, I mean the most generous, loving, you know, the, the, you know the, uh, uh, it's literally a champion, especially of people who were, had the, uh, someone's boot on their neck. There's no better champion to have than Pat Conway. There's just a little bit, just a little bit of hater in it. You know, and I, and I, and I, and I, you know, and me being where I'm from, I thought, yeah, go ahead. 
<laughs> and he never did. But, but you know, I, I don't read book reviews because um, even if they're good, you're not good enough. And I, and I, but I could hear as, as, as people called me and told me about this. And, you know, uh, agents and, and editors always say the same thing. It's all right. Books still selling like sliced bread. Yeah, that's all. It's all right. It's all they care. You know, but uh, but I could hear Pat. You know, or <laughs> <laughs> I could hear him. You know, just hear him. I know what he would say. He would say, "That's all right." Stephen King saying you can't ride is like. Taylor Swift telling Patsy Klein she can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't play right. and, 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 and you know that's what he would have done. And I think that's what I, and, and you know, I think it's, everybody had a piece of that. You know, everybody had a piece of it. And, um, but I think the thing that people like me will miss most, and I can't speak to the people that had all of them, but I, I know that what people like me will miss most is, you know, that wind at your back. You know, that, that kind of, it's almost a shove when you would, when you would, uh, Hit that bad spot, hit that bad place, and everybody does, because riders are crazy. You know, they're not they're not like the real people. There's something missing and wrong and and terribly flawed. I mean, don't be really, I mean you're telling you, she looks normal, but, <laughs> but we're not right. And, and occasionally we need that show and and I'll miss that show. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what he he was best at. Uh, I could not go complain to him about um, a wine and moan and groan about a, a bad review or anything because he uh, like a, he'd go after somebody and learn you know that. But then he would tell me, "Do not read your don't read them, don't read them because you know the." get the, the good ones, that's not the ones you're going to remember. Which one will you remember? All the ones you get and fume about and talk about and carry about is that one bad one. And uh, uh, so, uh, he, yeah, he was, he was a great, he was a great cheerleader for, you know, you're talking about the wind. back. I cannot say the wind beneath my wings for... I noticed I didn't say that. I changed that cliche around. Well, there's a reason for that, too. Okay, I told Pat a story one time about... Uh, he thought this was one of the funnest stories he ever heard. And then that became... You know how things can become a buzzword from, uh, between you and so forth. But... Um, in one of our churches one time in my former life um, I had uh, I actually I think I used to sing in the Sunday rock but um, a beauty queen in the choir and she did a, a solo and dedicated it to the person who had made her what she was you know who had she was a beauty queen and she had a uh, and then the Miss Alabama pageant, you know, and sang and all this kind of stuff. So she dedicated this to me. To, to her teacher, and she sang, The Wind Beneath My Wings, you know. It, was, uh, it must have been cold in my shadow. You never had sunlight in your face because you were always, you know, beneath me, you were always in my shadow and so forth. And everybody in the, in the congregation said, Oh, that's so touching, that's so sweet. And my two sorry sons <laughs> sitting next to me. I thought they were down like this. And I thought they were just so moved that they were crying as well. And I looked down there and they were 
giggling like everything. <laughs> nope. I said, what an egomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just cracking him up. And I go back and he thought that was, you know, so funny story. So I'd legal, you know, we'd legal notes to each other and say, you know, you forgot to get the so and so, but that's okay. You're still the friend of me. <laughs> <laughs> really thought about having that, that song sung in his funeral, but <laughs> <laughs> it would have haunted me. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but I'm going to think about that at least once a day now. I know. <laughs> well, you know, I thought it was a beautiful song. I like that. My two, you know, sorry sons learned it for me forever, but, but it... That too was Pat. I was a. I was at a. Uh, you would see Pat at places that you did not expect to see him, like in the hall of a Marriott in Nashville. <laughs> you know, just and and, uh, and and people get all over me. They say I have one outfit. I mean, Pat didn't. Jake Reach gave me a suit just so I'd have two outfits, but, but he. Uh, <laughs> I had a, 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 he had, yeah, he had one outfit, yeah. right? And he had a, and well, he had about three different pair of khakis. Right. And uh, and he did not like it if I changed the khaki. I, I, you know, I hemmed those things, I patched them, I did all this kind of stuff, because he would get mad and he wouldn't wear a new pair when I first got it. But eventually he'd have to, because I would swap it out for, you know, one that got so afraid around him or something that I finally it was amazing. I was so proud to have him with me on a, a, any book event because that meant that I was not the worst dressed person. <laughs> and, uh, but, but what was beautiful, what was beautiful about it was you have a, a there's a place that you get and, and, and if you're real, real lucky in this business where uh, you don't have to drive, you know, 600 miles to get to Kiwanis, you know, and, 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 but I would do events that have been on, like the Southern Festival Books in Nashville and, and, and the Alabama Book Festival down in Montgomery, just events that you need to go to. Because that's where the people who read your books live and you need to see them. And if you don't see them, then you feel like you're cheating. Like you're cheating. You ain't doing right. And I would see Pat. Pat didn't have to. But he would be at those places. And, and, I, and I was in... Uh, and I wanted him to be, to be proud of me. But I was also just dumb enough to think he would be proud of me for for to be proud of me for for pretending to be a big shot. Like if you know if I had two hundred people or three hundred people in line, that that would be impressive to him. And I was at the Alabama Book Festival, and I had three hundred people in line. And it was just, you know, kind of one of those warm, great days where you get to talk to people and, you, you know, you, you're, you're signing books and, 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 and you know, and, and when the 300 people came by, the line re replenished itself and it just seemed like it was going to go on forever. And I thought perhaps I had died and gone to, <laughs> gone to book signing heaven. <laughs> And, and I was there, and I'm not making it, you know, I was there two and a half hours, and after about two and a half hours, finally the line began to, and boy, older folks in line were <coughs> cussing me under their breath, and I couldn't, you know, but finally it got down to, to ten, and then to, then to seven, and then to three, and that's when Pat Conway showed up. <laughs> <laughs> And he took his seat right next to me. 
as his line began to form out toward Prattville. <laughs> And he looked over at me without smiling and said, that's okay, son. Maybe some of mine will spill over. <laughs> he was a prince. Should we take some questions, Jacob? This has nothing to do with that kind of This is uh, Rick. Uh, what will your next release be? You put that in there, did you? Uh, <laughs> somebody in case y'all haven't figured this out yet, I, I know that many of you know Jay Priest. Those of you who don't know Jay Priest should know that he is the biggest liar. <laughs> Yeah, and my favorite lie, and it continues to be my favorite lie. Uh, I'm doing an event somewhere in the South. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, anyway, Jay Reese told the story this way. Uh, just to show people what kind of good person I was. Said that, that there was a, a, an older lady in a wheelchair, a heavy motorized wheelchair, and uh, was trying to get into the venue that I was speaking which was already full. She was trying to get in onto a ramp that did not work, that didn't ex really exist. So she's trying to get in the venue and can't get in the venue, which is full. And that I just walked up and said, that's all right, ma'am, I'll handle this. And I, not only did I make room for her, but I bodily picked up that wheelchair <laughs> and that lady, because I'm a hoss. <laughs> I did pick and shovel work. I thought driving a dump truck was an easy job. So I picked her up and carried her inside. Which is a wonderful, wonderful story. If it were true. <laughs> it was a 21-year-old in a ski boot. <laughs> and I did pick her up and carry her inside. <laughs> But, uh, but, but uh, anyway, it'd be just like Jake to plant that question knowing that he'd get some pre-orders. <laughs> but my mama has, has been sick. But she's fine now. She's fine now. And, and we're hoping everything. Uh, uh, she had some major surgery and some follow-up treatments. And, and, uh, and we had to do something easy. Jerry Lee Lewis was not easy. So we had to do something easy. So uh, uh, I asked Mama once for a recipe, something she was cooking. And she said, well, hon, I've never written down a recipe. In 80 years, she's never written down a recipe. So she and I, for a year, have been sitting down. And we did it in the hospital. We did it in, in her recovery. We, and I've just been writing down recipes for pinto beans with ham. For <laughs> Beef short ribs with potatoes and Spanish onions. You know, uh, 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 poke salad. You know, and, and uh, you know, crackling, crackling cornbread. And and so blue collar, working class, southern food. There's a lot of southern food and there's a lot of southern food cookbooks, but there aren't that many blue collar that are not cliche. You know, that are not that don't include some pretty offensive language or, you know, and you know how it is in the South. There, there aren't any Southerners like us in popular culture. We are rather normal. If you're going to be in popular culture and be a Southerner, you're very hair suit. That's a good word. I learned that at Harvard. And, and, you're, and you're very, you know, you're, you're really backward. You've got to be really backward and very hairy. And you and I are neither one of those, especially you. And I didn't think to take that much time, but that's that, but anyway. We're going to do that this fall, this coming fall. Right. Knowing how slow you write, it's silly to take three hours now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you said that as we're uh, winding down, would you tell us all a few details that, as early as it is about the Afghan World Literary Center, what the plans may be, and uh, well, tell us about the building downtown. Um, let me, I'll back up just a little bit and tell you how the, the center came about after after Pat died. <laughs> um, they, these, some of the folks on city council and the mayor's friend of ours and so forth approached me and they were trying to decide what to do as, as a way of honoring uh, Pat and we're talking about doing a statue at the waterfront park and Rick will know this, the only thing I can think of is what Pat would say about that. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine a statue of my fat butt down there? I can just hear it. You know? And he would, he would help me for sure if, if I encouraged that idea. And uh, so we were talking about uh, his agent was there, his publisher, and so forth at the time. And we were, we were talking about his generosity and wish there was something that would, that we could, you know, more of a living legacy to him, at you, you know, or something, something like that. So um, uh, that's that sort of how how the idea and and it was it was just an idea and it was you know one of those things when they could maybe in a few years that would be something wonderful that we. We could do, and uh, uh, boy, it, it just got some very dedicated people behind it. That I, I certainly wanted to see this happen very much, but I could not have done this by myself. And so we have this uh, uh, building that's just a block off of downtown uh, Hubert. It's an 1800s built, 1880. Well, I think it was. 18 built in 1880 something. So I read one time it was Annabella and it's not. Um, and it's, it's the Charleston style with, you know. And so this, um, uh, we were offered use of, of the downstairs of the building, the upstairs is ready. But um, so what, it's all the room we need now, but hopefully we will uh, expand, you know. Uh, one of these. There's a carriage house with it. It's rented out too, but we have plans that one day, we could, you know, we can take over the whole block. And, and uh, but what we want to do is uh, like programming. Uh, we want to have uh, workshops and bring, you know, writers that have lecture series. But we also want to, you know, make sure it's uh, uh, multimedia. We're talking about uh, uh, these. Poetry, you know, these poetry groups to go around doing these presentations, good stuff like that. We definitely want to do it. So we think we are envisioning this as a as a writing center, uh, but as a an educational and a cultural uh, center in Newport as well. And we're we're hoping that this will attract a lot of people who will come. You know, Stephen King's speaking there first. <laughs> <laughs> Now, see if I don't get rich. <laughs> but, no, we we'll bring in some hot shot riders. And, uh, uh, well, he's, he's going to see them. He's going to see them. <laughs> <He's gone. laughs> Ever since he got run over by the next one. He's just slowed him down. <laughs> you can have a, a statue. There are statues you can do, though. Uh-oh. Yeah. What? You can have a big crab cake. <laughs> Didn't he do like the world best crap cake? He did the world best crap cake. There's no, there's or, no question. Or just a, just a hand reaching up, you know, in inspiration, palm up like that, with a half the German chocolate. Cake. <laughs> and the women. <laughs> with those words, you can inspire. <laughs> So the so that's the that's the literary center. We hope to open. We just hired. I say hired. We don't have the money yet. Pay, but he, <laughs> he was just, he was uh, enthusiastic enough to, to come up. Uh, so we just uh, uh, start started with a staff 
a fun right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one office worker who is about six hours a week, there it gets on before. But um, we, so we want to start a program first. We have our first program. Well, in January. Not so we started the programming tonight. That's right. This is the first one. <laughs> but it will grow, and we hope that uh, everybody here will want to come breathe that air and come visit, and we'll do off site events from the future to Birmingham. Absolutely. We, we really do want to do a lot of outreach. And we're going to come to a fun part of the program as we're winding down. Uh, Assume you all uh, read your emails and visited the website that co chair of the Pat Conroy Literary Center is, uh, again, her name, she's a director, producer, movie star, sings a little bit. Her name is Barbara Streisand, for those of you who haven't uh, read your email or haven't sit in. And we have two one of a kinds. And we're going to give notes to somebody here tonight. Uh, for the Pat Conroy Literary Center. We were raffling one of those babies off, and you generous folks have sent in a whole bunch of raffles that you donated for 10 bucks a pop. And somebody will receive it now. We sent these all over the, literally the world, so they may not be here tonight, but there's one person here tonight that bought a ton of them, so his audience is good. In fact, there's several out here I see who have bought multiple books. And what you're going to get when Sandra makes one person happy is, I guess, one of the most unique books in the world. It's a um, first edition of the new that kind of world, world country heart and inscribed on the end paper are these words. For the love of reading, enjoy this book by the glorious Pat Conroy. And it's signed Barbara Streisand, 2016. And the owner of this book is... <laughs> He knows I would lie. <laughs> oh, I read it. Oh, I have to get my glasses. <laughs> but I can tell it says Cassandra. <laughs> really? <laughs> I got it right here. Now I'm holding out for that Stephen King book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark Childress said he wanted to hunt down everybody that ever gave him a bad review and kill them. <laughs> <clears throat> and the winner is, oops, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> you want to give it a try? Fibonacci. Fibonacci. <laughs> And this is the other story I'll tell you about this guy. We 
We sent out emails literally around the world, and we've been bidding on this book. Started at 50 bucks to 100 and so forth. And it's been going on for a week. And the high bidder at this time was supposed to be in San Francisco, so we got his cell phone. We're going to have one of the staff call him. And hopefully, one of you guys will outbid. So, Tim Luther Notch, you won't get a, a collection of these bottles. <laughs> <laughs> the high bid at the moment, but not for long, because I see several folks who must own this book about the Prince of Tides by the director, producer, and star of the Prince of Tides. It's got so many Academy nominations. The high bid, temporarily, before this bidding starts, is $1,000. We'll take $50 above it. And so I'm looking for somebody who will get $1,050 for this three, four, five thousand dollars We got ten fifty. Do I hear eleven hundred for this book is probably worth eight four? Literally, think of to kill a mockingbird signed by Gregory Peck. <laughs> Seriously, Mark Gaines is gone with the wind. This is Barbara Streisand signing that kind of book. I've got ten fifty. I've got eleven. I've got eleven hundred. I need eleven fifty. Somebody, and I've got $1,300. Oh, I've got $1,300 for Barbara Streisand. I'm looking for $1,350 to own this three, four, five thousand dollars bill. There's got to be some Mountain Brook people out there. <laughs> I've got fifteen hundred for Barbara Streisand. Oh shoot! Does anybody have? How about seventeen? I'll take seventeen. If you scratch your nose, you got it. I've got fifteen hundred. I need. I'll take fifteen. Sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred. Back here. I have 1600 and a big old boy here will help me check me. I've got $1,600. I really need $1,700 like this guy. Can I hear $1,700? Barbara Streisand is going for $1,600 unless you'll say it. $1,600 for Barbara Streisand is going once. Too late. $1,700. I've got seventeen hundred. I think somebody's going to try to cut out the bidding of two thousand. I'll bet the two thousand and wipe this joint out. I'll bet one little two thousand. I've got eighteen hundred. Eighteen hundred. Told you two thousand will wipe that guy out. <laughs> I, I would take 
Harvest I've ever seen him work for somebody else. <laughs> Barbara's on the phone. She says she is going to tell everybody she knows in Hollywood and New York that Birmingham, Alabama couldn't come up with more than 19. <laughs> Save our city. <laughs> and say it's a day and he's not even in the room here. Thank you. 